Hello and welcome along to another episode of this FM20 story, A Wandering Dork with me, Daniel. We're back for our end of season review today as we finish season 3. And of course it's finished on the ultimate high, which has shaped what we're going to talk about in this episode. So today we're going to talk almost exclusively about preparing to turn professional. Something that's really important in these one club stories. It's something we didn't actually get to do last year as we picked Torquay, a fairly big side in the National League South. They obviously were professional already. So we probably won't have on this channel in the future. If anything, we'll probably go lower down the leagues and use an edited database from lower divisions. I've got a few local clubs I want to manage in future years, so this is going to be an important step every season. For most of us, it's one of the most popular game types. We go from the bottom league to the top in a country, and in most of those, you have that transition from semi-pro to professional, and adapting to it can be one of the hardest things. Normally, it comes with a promotion as well, which does make it incredibly difficult, because you've already got a lot on your plate. So we're going to talk today about dealing with that not so much in the grand scheme of things because we've already talked about transfers and how to adapt to promotions but this one will be entirely about going professional and a few little tips that could help you along the way as well as some things I do in my say for my benefit and we'll answer some questions that have come up from the previous two as well so I hope you're looking forward to that but a massive thank you to everyone who's following the series so far I really do appreciate it if you're enjoying the series and looking forward to another end of season review please do put a thumbs up on the video. We'll have a vote for player of the season up in the eye above as well, so make sure when we get there you go and cast your vote. And for the first time in this series, we'll actually go and look at the end of season awards for the club and take you through all of that process as well. Something that's really important as we move up a division again, as we try to decide which players are going to stay. Again, a massive thank you to everyone that's helped me reach a thousand subscribers. I really do appreciate it. And at some point over the last week, I will have put out a thank you message and a quick channel update with things that are changing as I look to try and improve this channel. The daily FM20 content is going nowhere though, so subscribe for daily videos from the game. We've got this story every two days and then our head coach series and the others. I really am enjoying both of them at the moment and I'm having a great time making the series. So I hope you're enjoying watching them as well as we get into our end of season review today. And the first thing we do before we focus on the summer is we'll go ahead and skip through to our end of season news. Okay, so we're back two days after that famous playoff final victory. Of course, I will say, if you've missed any of the series so far, or any of our other stories, you can catch up with them in the eye above. But let's go and have a look at the best 11 for the season, see who's been picked by our fans and club. And of course, we've got to make an end of season player of the year vote as well. So we're going to have to pick out a few names, although I'm pretty sure I know who's going to win it. So in terms of our overall best 11, six players going in, including Terrell Whitaker, top scorer with 26 goals in his first year for the club. Club, and he's going to be a key player for us in League 2. The end of season awards are there as well. Whitaker winning player of the year. And in fact, all three strikers are right at the top there. Cameron Archer not getting in the team of the year, despite being ahead of Presley in the player of the season vote. A little bit surprising that. Cameron Archer also got goal of the year. Whitaker young player of the season. And also signing of the season as well. So the strikers have had a bit of a clean sweep this year. I don't think the other two have actually been that special. But Archer was obviously the big man on the big stage. And as a result, he's probably remembered more fondly now. So our average attendance is significantly higher this season, something we're very proud of of course, and the fact that we've managed to get promotion is most important, doesn't really matter how we've done it. We've got a news item with our club vision which is changing for next season of course, fight bravely against relegation, they're not even expecting us to stay up, although we've done this a couple of times in the past, and then by the start of the season we've had a new one which is upgraded, and it's often been a lot harder at that point, so I think when we came up to the National League that happened, it certainly happened after the first season in the head coach so it's something I'm a little bit wary of I've got a feeling they will upgrade these later on the squad dynamics are good everything's looking well we're going to be keeping a lot of these players where possible it's really good to see Matt Smith up in highly influential the loan is going to be here for another year it just guarantees us a first 11 player that's going to have a big influence on the squad and that's going to be crucial at the higher level as we're going to have to fight bravely against the bottom two we've got an end of season team meeting which we'll deal with off camera injuries again a little bit of a problem this year year. Of course a bit worse than last season when we got off the hook quite lightly. Presley, Adoma and Smith all missing key stages of the season. Jordan Einer out on loan, he's been injury prone too. And Gail Calabra as well, the young left winger, probably won't sign him again because of that. Prior, Kavanagh, Fabio Lopez, they've all had short injuries, but again not really a disastrous year. It's something we've been very keen on. I try to avoid youngsters who have got the injury prone trait. When it pops up in the scout report, I generally ignore them, particularly if it's really bad and it says they're always going to struggle 
with them. Albert Adoma was an exception to that as an experienced pro, because we just needed a bit of quality near the end, and although he did get injured before the end of the season, he was so crucial for us in the build-up to that. We've got the end of season break, I don't get to choose when they come back for once, that seems a little bit strange. Charlie Wakefield winning player of the season for the National League, 20 assists from midfield there. Chesterfield promoted as well, so we've got no chance of signing him, but the fact they've got him on two grand a week shows just how well we've done to compete with them. Whittaker's top scorer, he's of course been brilliant, fantastic from him across the board, and we'll probably go and have a look at these two other ones. Luke Charman again on 1.8 grand a week. This is the level of player we're competing with, and then Aloni from Middlesbrough at Hartlepool has obviously done a good job, the youngster. The manager of the year shortlist is out as well. We're not the favourites for it because the Chesterfield boss is there, but I'm pretty sure who I'm going to vote for, and it's the order shop manager, Gavin Strachan. They gave us two good games in a season and a bit of a run in the playoff final, and for them to be up there is as big as an achievement as us, and we really do appreciate the work he's doing. So that's the end of season review sorted. We're not going to worry too much about the rest of that for now, but of course we've got to talk about turning professional. We've already had a news item for that. We're going to be turning pro at the end of the season, although quite often you get that message, and then it happens a little bit earlier when you're going up to the Football League. They put it in place a week or two later, so we'll skip ahead and see if that happens. If it hasn't by the start of June, we'll complete our episode, and then we'll obviously go and look at the English Football Pyramid and the European tournaments to see who's been winning. Well, some more big news here, and a little bit confusing, actually. We've had some stadium announcements. We're not getting an increased capacity, but a lot of it's been converted from standing to seats. Of course, that's a requirement at League 2 level, but we've had two announcements in two days here. This one says it's going to take four months to complete, and we're relocating to the People's Pension Stadium. For anyone who doesn't know, that's Crawley Town, another lower football league club. But the message before said it was going to take seven months, so I've no idea how long we're going to be out of here. Whitaker sets the record for most man and a matches. A bit more positive news to end on there. We'll carry on going through the next couple of weeks just to see if we turn professional early. Okay, it's a big news day, not even a week later. Dorkin have offered us a new two-year contract, not just the one. We're guaranteed a job even if we go down next year. The club vision hasn't changed just yet, but again, that'll probably happen at the start of the season. But more importantly, as we'll deal with that in a minute, we turn professional with immediate effect. So we're already set for the summer transfer window. We've been given the option to hire more staff as well. That's something that's going to be so crucial in the preparation for our first professional season and will be a focus throughout a lot of this episode. We avoid a tax hit and we've got an increased scouting budget, so there's plenty of good things going on at the club. But what we're going to do now is skip ahead to the start of the transfer window and we're going to have a talk about how we're adapting to professional life. So we're back on the 3rd of June. The National League transfer window has just opened. It means we get the little benefit before we go up to the Football League. We've got an extra week or two to get people in. We're going for our usual process. If we scroll down a bit here, you can see that we're bringing loads of trialists in as always. We've been improving the staffing. We put out a couple of adverts and got good responses. So we've been able to improve in that area too. But just to show you the squad so you get an idea, we've already got a few trialists in place. There's more to come and more that have accepted our offers and some pretty exciting looking ones there as well but there'll be a surprise for the next episode to see if we're able to sign any of those names so you'll have a little bit of familiarity but we want to focus on turning professional preparing for our first professional season after being a semi-pro club in non-league football we're going into the football league and I've got to talk about how I approach it it may be different for you of course but as you've seen before in previous reviews and episodes I do play the game in a quite detailed way generally I am a massive football fan and I try to replicate that in game rather than making it a bit more like a story. So we're going to talk about how I adapt to turning professional with a club. It probably isn't the most common way. I guess the immediate thought of most people is let's get our new players contracts. That's not worth doing at all just yet. We're still listed as National League to the 24th of June or whenever the new fixtures come out in a few weeks time. So we've got loads of time to sort that out but we need to have everything in place for pre-season. The squad ironically is the least important part of that for me. I almost completely ignore it by the trial list until mid-June and even those trial lists I'll leave a bit longer than normal and then if any of them get snapped up by other clubs, so be it, we won't complain too much. But by the looks of it, the highest one is three-star ability, so I don't need to get too worried just yet. And if they do end up going elsewhere, then a bit like Matt Smith, we might even be able to loan them back. But the main area I focus on to start with is the finances screen to see how
how things are. You can see we've come back into the black and we're going to get TV money for the EFL. So that is going to make a bit of a difference for the club. And we've also got plenty of new wage budget to spend too. But we're not going to talk about that too much as the most important thing for me is staffing. We just check the finances are all right and then we can go ahead with our staffing plans. So we've been given an extra coach, which we've already employed at this club. And we'll go and meet him as part of our transfer special in the next episode. But to me, it's so important that you get as many coaches in as possible and as many scouts in too. And the physios here are all right anyway. So we will try and expand on that a little bit if possible. The reason is that we've got a lot of players on semi-pro contracts and some that we won't want to give a professional deal to. They'll just be there as backups until we're able to improve the squad. We don't want to offer people two-year professional deals just because we haven't been able to get a replacement in. I've done my work earlier in the season. Most players are on a contract till next year, so I don't have to worry about any of that for now. The main thing for us is that we get the staffing in, so when we do get the extra injuries, if we do need a quick loan replacement, we can get them in without too much hassle, and of course we'll be able to adapt to the higher level. So you can see here, our team may have been a little bit average during the season, and you say maybe we're overperforming, but if you look at our coaching and recruitment team, it is right up there at the very top notch. Now of course that's been helped by the fact that we've brought in another coach ready for League 2, but it was already right up there in all bar one field. So if we go and have a look at the coaching team now, this becomes the most important part of the summer for me. All of the coaches that are on part-time deals, if we want to keep them and we know they're going to be good enough, we're going to get them on full-time deals for two years to make sure that they're working here all week, so whichever players are in, they can give the maximum. It means they can give more to their individual training elements, where we set up their coaching assignments for the team, and that means they're able to help the development of our youngsters. As a club like us with a small reputation, we're going to have to rely on youngsters coming in still. We might be able to get one or two experienced ones in, but again, they're probably those that haven't reached their potential, so we want to make sure that we can give them the best of their ability, as we need to improve players if we want to stay up. So you can see we've brought one coach in, who we're not going to look at in too much detail to us yet, but he is on a two-year full-time deal. All of these guys we're going to go and offer the same to. Make sure that's done before the start of pre-season. We want them training every day of the week, and we want them working here with the players as much as possible. We've got a lot of good coaches. Haycock's a very good assistant. Richie Sutton's a brilliant head of youth development. Yussi Askeline and we know we want to keep. Ben Dixon, the fitness coach, is very good as well. Martin O'Connor I'm quite a big fan of. The only one I'm not sure of is Stuart Lewis, but for this season he's certainly going to be good enough, so he'll probably get himself a new deal as well. We want to go and ask the board for an extra scout and physio. I need to pack out the coaching team as much as possible. The backroom staff is the most important part here. If we can expand that team and spend a lot of money on it, we'll be able to develop whatever players we've got. It's all about getting the most out of the players, rather than trying to sign very slightly better ones. Going up half a star as a player means nothing if you're paying an extra 600 quid a week. You don't want to pay wages for that, when you could just improve the player you've got already. Yes, it takes an extra month or two, probably gives you a bit of a difficult start to the season, but it means you've got that profitability moving forward, and you don't have to continually trawl through the transfer window. I love it in the summer, it's really enjoyable with the trialists coming in and out, but I hate having to focus on it all year. I like to just be able to scout in the background, and not have to worry too much about signings. So if I give you one tip out of today, or you take anything from the episode, please let it be that. Focus on the coaching team and the backroom staff before you go on to the playing squad. They are the most important part of turning professional. You can get 20 really good pros in, but if all your coaches are on part-time contracts still, they're not going to be working with them on two days a week. So you'll have players in every day, but then no one bar you in the training ground with them. And if you started as a Sunday league coach like me, your attributes aren't going to benefit them too much. So that's the most important thing for me. And of course, more scouts and more physios means we can find more players. Physios means we can look after people better. Recoveries from matches is going to be important. We'd expect to have less possession as we go up the leagues again. So again, the players are going to be chasing the ball a lot more. And we need to be able to get that fitness in place to make sure we can recover them and look after any little one or two day injuries. So that's a big part of the summer for me. There's a couple of other parts we'll look at as well. Of course, we will look at the playing staff next too, as that is also important once we've done everything else. But let's take a quick break to find our player of the season. As I mentioned earlier, there's a vote in the eye above. There's four players to choose from that I've picked this time round, and I'm hoping you'll agree with me, but I've put another there just in case. 
So if we put them in selection info, so you can see their average rating for the season. I'm obviously assuming that the favourite is Terrell Whitaker. 26 goals from 40 starts, 7.31 average rating. A really good player this season, done a wonderful job for us. And I think he's going to be a superstar next year too. I put Cameron Archer in there just because of his exploits at the end of the year. And he did outscore Presley in half the amount of starts. And then the other two candidates are Matthew Smith in midfield. A real big game player towards the end of the season. And Fabio Lopez, who's done a wonderful job from the right his goals and assists probably deserve a better rating so they're the four i've gone for there's the option to vote for other and you can let me know down in the comments who you think should win it but i think they're the obvious candidates and we'll be interested to see who wins i'll obviously announce the winner in the next season review just so we can keep up to date with it my apologies for forgetting in the first two seasons the vote for the first year was really good and thank you to everyone who interacted but we're going to talk about it in more detail each year now to give you an opportunity to have your say too but let's very quickly go back to the second part of preparing for going professional, which does revolve around scouting and players. Of course, they are important elements. Although staffing's the most important, you've got to have able players. So we'll go and have a look through our scouted screen and if there's any bargains we might be able to find. So we've already done our usual bit in terms of getting in free agents. You probably have to do it twice at this level. Once we get to the start of July and we're officially a League 2 club, we will possibly be able to attract a few more. So I don't want to sign too many players just yet. As I mentioned, before I think we probably will sign a few less this season I want to trust a lot of this squad to keep us up and I don't know how some of them will react to full-time training they may well go on to become better players We've got lots in the squad with pretty high potential and I'm going to put a little bit of trust in them. But if we can get six or seven in, a little bit of quality and experience, we of course won't complain and it should help us see us over the line. So in terms of scouting, it's very similar to the promotion last year. We just want to make sure we give a little bit of leeway. All of these players have been scouted in comparison to the National League and we've got to make sure they're ready for League 2 level. So I'm looking along the line. We've got a very small transfer budget. We don't really want to spend much money. But if there's an exceptional prospect from the lower leagues, it's not something I mind doing because they're going to have such low wages. So this Chris Box at Woking is an example. Low determination, but we know we can work on that. His other attributes are all really good. But his scout report's from November last year, so we're going to go and scout him again. If that report comes back good, then we'll try and sign him for five grand or so. And that's a little bit of a low-risk investment. Nothing I have a problem with doing. Once we've got through that stage and all of the trialists coming in, if there's still two or three positions we're looking for, we'll go to our director of football. We've got a pretty good one and he's trying to sign some youngsters already. I'm letting him put bids in for people, but I've got the overall say of confirming transfers. So we can request positions there. We start with free transfers and then go to loans. He's our director of football. He's been going out and seeing loads of games. He's been working closely with our scouting teams and doing all of their meetings. So he's going to know a lot of players and he's going to have a bigger pool than me. I've been spending most of my time on the train Training round or watching Dorking Wanderers games, so I'm not going to have seen as many. So Lewis Hone is going to be a key man this season, and although he's not got a big reputation, he's got very good knowledge and is a good professional. Again, a priority to get him on a pro deal. We want to make sure he's here as much as possible. The more he's working, the more football he can see, and the more influence he can have into good signings. But let's finish on the squad, which is often perceived to be the most important bit, and after the staffing, it is very important. Once we've got our staff down to professional deals, we can do exactly the same with our team and we don't want to go out of our money pool here and we don't want to give them to backup players either. So the only ones I want to offer professional deals to now are ones who are going to accept slightly more of the same money, ones who are going to be definitely in our first 22 next season. So I've got my first and second choice for both positions on paper in front of me and I'll only be offering contracts to those players. The youngsters who are at the club, unless they've got amazing potential, we're not going to worry about doing that just yet. Most of them will be out on loan at semi-pro clubs anyway, so it probably isn't going to have to be biggest impact. The mentoring groups are going to be more crucial for that, so we'll keep them in their groups with Gallagher. But if we go and have a look at our reports for now, just to see where the potential is. So I'll take an example or two here for you. The likes of O'Dwyer and Whelan are probably going to be here next year. They may well be fourth choice in their position. If we get a lot of good replacements, they might be on their way out. But I don't want to offer them new deals. Don't forget if they sign a professional deal with us, they're then less likely to move on to a National League or National League South club that are semi-pro. And that's going to make it difficult for us to get players off the books and in turn that keeps our wage budget up and means we're not able to make as much of a profit so we've got to think about all areas of the club the same I guess goes for Fergal Hale Brown he's actually earning more than our first choice keeper so we have to bear those things in mind as well value for money is important it's not the be all and end all but we don't want 
to go out of our depth. So the likes of Whitaker and Archer already want a grand a week, and I'm not in a position to offer that just yet, so they'll stay on their part-time contracts for now, but they've been developing quite well anyway. The only ones we've signed up to professional deals so far are Jake Gallagher, who we mentioned we would. He's taken a slight wage cut. Josh Giurgi signed on for very slightly more, and he's going to be able to cover on both flanks. But again, these players are going to be backups next year, and he's just seeing if they'll develop as much as we hope. Those who are backups this season are probably on their way out. We're not going to worry about at all. And then the ones who are going to be first choice or on the subs bench, we'll try and see if they'll accept new deals. So the likes of Zamura, Harbottle, Rams bottom the keeper from this season. Ethan Vaughan who's come on leaps and bounds, a couple of others as well, we'll offer all of those professional deals, but we do have to be a little bit more ruthless here, we don't want to sign every player to a pro deal, even if they're in our plans for the first half of next year, if we know they're not going to be afterwards, I don't want to take that gamble, I want to make sure that only the core are on professional deals, so it's easier to get rid of the ones we need to, it's not the nicest thing to say, but it's the harsh reality of a small football business, they have to look after costs, they're often going to make losses, and we need to make sure we've got no unnecessary expenditure. So keeping those on part-time deals just makes it a bit easier to get them out. A simple thing that many people including myself used to forget about. So we're going to keep those on semi-pro deals and then we'll see what we look like at the start of the season. So we'll be back in the next episode for that. What we are going to do before we finish this one is just go and look at the competitions around England. We've looked at the end of each season to see how teams are getting on and we'll look at the major European competitions as well. But if you did enjoy that insight into turning professional and the way I approach things, then please do put a thumbs up on the video. Of course, it's not the same for everyone and you may completely disagree. Let me know in the comments if you do anything different. But for me, I just wanted to emphasise that the focus for me is always on staffing first. I don't really look at the playing squad straight away. Getting staff on professional deals is so much more important. So let's go and have a look at the footballing pyramid. We'll start with the Premier Division, of course. I think Manchester City won it. They did. They finished five points clear of Arsenal in the end. Liverpool just behind that and Chelsea completing the top four. Tottenham and United fifth and sixth with Bournemouth and Everton in the Europa League as well. Norwich, Reading and Brentford all on their way down. Lacazette top scorer in the Premier League. Rian Brewster at Leicester, the Liverpool youngster. He's doing really well for them too. We nearly signed him in our loot and beat a save actually, but in the end he rejected us to go elsewhere. I think it was Rangers he picked in that save, but I'm not holding a grudge for that one. Let's go to the Championship. Derby won the playoff final against Stoke. Joined by Swansea and what for both returning to the Premier League. Who went down? Nottingham Forest to League One. If you remember the first season, they actually won the FA Cup. In Season 2, they played in the Europa League. And in Season 3, they've been relegated. Possibly the most eventful club of this series so far. What a bit of a turnaround that is. Two years after winning the FA Cup, they're relegated to the third tier, having lost in the Europa League group stages. They're joined by Sheffield Wednesday and Sunderland, who make a swift return to League One. And they won't be joined by Accrington Stanley. That They've made it to the championship. Good on them. Bristol City and Millwall going back up. Luton again losing out in the playoffs. Blackpool, Wickham, Forest Green and Shrewsbury coming down. All of those will be big opponents for us next year. And then into League Two. Let's have a look at them. Can't believe Accrington went up to the championship. Bolton, the title holders, they're starting their recovery. Exeter, Bradford and Northampton joining them. Stevenage down to the National League. As a Morecambe just above them. So we won't be playing either of those sides next year. But they're still a very good roster of teams in that division. Then on to the National League, which we obviously know well this year. Ourselves and Chesterfield going up. Woking Maidenhead, Solihull Moors and FC Halifax going down. Solihull seemed to be really underrated in game. Though of course three seasons in a lot could have changed. I doubt Tim Flowers is still manager there. He's not, so unfortunately that's probably where it went wrong. A brilliant manager doing a good job in real life. And last week they were part of a brilliant FA Cup tie against Rotherham. Though unfortunately they lost out at the death. Let's look at the National League North and South. Nuneaton coming up for the second time in this series. Harrogate, the champions, they're joining them in the National League. With Warrington up in third as well. A really interesting division that season. Gays head down into the regional leagues. Darlington, Spennymore and Stourbridge joining them. And then in the equivalent league, the South. Chelmsford coming up alongside Boreham Wood. Hemel Hempstead relegated out of the Vanarama Leagues. A side that we managed in the FM19 head coach. We didn't have a good time with them and they're struggling in this one as well. That is a little bit of a pity for a local club, but unfortunately they're going to have to work their way back up. Basingstoke, Paul and Gosport join them. All expected, they weren't at this level at the start of the game. And if we move on to the cup competitions, Arsenal beat Chelsea in the FA Cup. A really good cup final that looked like. 
Bukayo Saka getting the second goal there. The Carabao Cup was won by Bournemouth, who beat Wolves in the final on penalties. And the Community Shield was Arsenal against Chelsea again, a repeat of that FA Cup final. Let's go and have a look at the Checker Trade Trophy, or Leasing.com as it's called now. Oh look, Luton Town won it. They won it in 2009, one of my favourite days as a football fan. I was in our minus 30 season as we were relegated from the Football League. But I'm sure Luton would have traded that for winning the playoffs. Omar Bogle and Becerra with a brace. Down to the National League and the FA Trophy. Chesterfield beating Sutton in the final. The double for them this year, the League and Cup. It's been a brilliant season for Chesterfield. Let's go and have a look at the European competitions, just so we can see who won those two as well. Did the English dominance continue? It did. Manchester City winning the final against Roma. The Champions League won by City for the third year in a row. They've become somewhat dominant in this competition. Down to the Europa League, Manchester United beating Lazio. Three different European winners in this save, and four in a row if you include Chelsea in real life. And then we should have the Europa Conference now as well. The first winners of that are Everton. The only English side in the competition go and win it. There you go, Moisey Keane, the top scorer. Everton winning it to complete a treble for the English sides. Man City, Man United and Everton winning the trophies. And English sides very much dominant in Europe. I'm really intrigued by how this competition works, particularly in the other series, the head coach, because as we move across the border, if we do get offered jobs abroad, this could be a real good route to stardom. So I'm hoping we'll get an opportunity there, and you can see Scottish clubs doing well in it as well. But let's go back to the home screen to finish off the episode, as we prepare for life in League 2. I've talked a little bit about preparing to turn professional, although of course it's just the way I go about things. Let me know in the comments what you thought of that. If you did enjoy it, please put a thumbs up on the video, and if anything stood out out to you from the end of season review then let me know if I missed anything going through the leagues for me Nottingham Forest was the standout one an FA Cup win a Europa League campaign and now a relegation in three seasons it's certainly been an eventful tale for them maybe they're a club we should start following but a massive thank you for joining me for another review. Subscribe to the channel for daily FM20 content from my two long-term stories. We'll be back with our transfer special for the Football League in two days' time with Dorking Wanderers. And in between now and then, we'll be back with the head coach with episodes every other day at 4.30. Daily Football Manager content on the channel, including a couple of special mini-series at Christmas. I'm really looking forward to that, so I hope you'll join me too, as I'm having a really great time making all this content. But a massive thanks for watching this one, and you'll continue to pause of the series as always i really do appreciate it and i hope to see you next time for the start of season four as we prepare for life in the football league and hopefully talk about some high quality transfers